Okay, well, why don't we start with this problem? Let's see uh, where we are with this. Uh, try number two here. <clears throat> if 26 grams of water at 18 degrees C are mixed with 49 degrees of water at 70 degrees C, find the final temperature of the system. Okay, well, they're looking for TF, the final temperature. And we know that if we have water at 18 degrees C mixed with 40 degrees and the final is at 7, 70, final final temperature, we know that the initial starting point of uh, water is 18 degrees Celsius, and it's in the liquid phase. And we know that the initial starting point of the other amount of water is 70 degrees. So I guess we can call that W2. And then that is at 70 degrees and we know that the final temperature is going to be in between 18 degrees and 70 degrees. Okay. All right. I think I got it working again here. So, oh, there we go. So, uh, let me catch up to you. You found that they were asking for the final temperature. And what was your prediction? My prediction would be is that it's going to, the final temperature will be in between 18 and 70 degrees. So, we could label our picture like this. Um, okay, good. And which problem are we doing here? Uh, Number two. Two. All right. So, uh, all right. And then you started working through the equations. So tell me uh, what, what equation did you write down first? So the first equation I used was um, Q equals MC delta T, where, well, I, at first I got um, zero is equal to... Um, uh, MC delta T plus, or what I mean to say is, um, like the Q total is equal to the sum of the Qs. So, um, this the summation of Q is equal to zero, where zero is equal to Q one plus Q two. Okay, so that would give us this equation, and then what? And in the first equation, I plugged in um, MC delta T, where M is 26 C, uh, 26 grams. C is the specific heat of water, 4.184. And then times uh, that by TF minus 18, the initial um, uh, temperature of the first sample of water. Okay. And then I said plus uh, another MC del M M2 C2 delta T2, where M is 49 times C, which is 4.184 times TF minus 70 degrees. Okay, good. All right, that was a good start. Now what? Now um, uh, we we can multiply M and C together, and in the, in the first part of the equation, I got one hundred and eight. Twenty-six um, times four point one eight four. Okay, yeah, one hundred. Mm-hmm. And eight, and uh, then you can. Or one hundred nine. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, one hundred nine. Mm-hmm. Um, multiply it, or distribute that through uh, TF1 and then multiply that by negative 18 and you will get 109 um, TF minus 1958. 1958. Let's see, 109 times 18. Oh. All right, so you must have actually rounded off a little bit differently than me here. 
All right, so anyway, uh, we both got about 1960 uh, anyway. Okay, good. And then um, plus 49 times 4.184, which is uh, approximately 205. And then you can um, also distribute that to TF2 minus 70. And then you'll get 205 TF minus uh, 14,351. Let's see. 205 times 70 is 14,300. And let's say I got 350. So again, you round it differently. Is this what you got? Yeah. Okay. Sounds good so far. By the way, um, are these two yep, T, T, two TFs the same or different? They're the same. So it doesn't make sense to call this TF2, which I think you said a second ago. It's just TF. We need to have it, uh, numbers for the delta T and for the specific heat, possibly, and for the mass. Um, the mass is definitely different, but the final temperature then are the same for both of them. Okay, so now what? Uh, you combine like terms, uh, so 109 plus 205 will give you 314. 109 plus 205. Okay, good. And then you get um, 16,309. So 16,309, divide that by 314, and I get approximately 52 degrees Celsius. Sixteen thousand three hundred nine divided by three hundred and fourteen. And what was your answer again? Fifty-two degrees Celsius. Does that answer make sense? Yeah. Because it was between these two. Okay, that's good. This is the first problem. Um, so, would you call this um, a one-sample or a two-sample problem? It's, it's actually, um, two-sample because. It, both of the grams of, uh, or sorry, not grams. Both the samples of water are going to reach thermal equilibrium. There, so there are two different um, samples of water. Yeah, that's right. Now, it's not because they're reaching thermal equilibrium that that it's two samples. It's just two samples because we have two different samples of water that start at different temperatures. Um, mo so we did a couple two sample problems last time. And when we did those, the two samples were all, always different substances, like water and gold or water and silver. This time, the two samples were the same substance, but they were two, still two different samples because they started at different temperatures. Uh, but it looks like you figured out how to do that. It's not much different than when uh, they're the same. So you're right. This is a two-sample problem. And for a two-sample problem, then what's the, the first general equation you write down? Uh, zero equals the summation of Q. Yeah. For a two-sample problem, the first equation you write down is zero equals the summation of the Q's. We don't want to forget how to do the one-sample problems. If you were doing a one-sample problem, what would be the first general equation you would write down? Q equals, or total Q is equal to Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3. If you have a one-sample problem, it doesn't make sense to say that all the heat exchanges add up to zero because the sample is going to be absorbing or releasing heat to the environment. So here you just have the obvious equation that the total heat is the sum of the individual steps. Uh, okay, good. So it's good that you saw the right way to solve this. Oops. So notice that in this case, when we're using the heating curve, we put both all the points on one curve. We put everything on the water curve because water was the only thing that we were dealing with. Try number three. If 84 grams of water 
and 22 degrees Celsius are mixed with 150 grams of ethanol 80 8 degrees Celsius. Find the temperature of the system. Now, I have a quick question. Yeah. For number two, if we just subtracted 70 degrees Celsius um, minus the 18, we would get the answer at the bottom. You, you say you get you would get the same answer. Yeah. What? Hmm. So that I'm guessing that might just be a coincidence, maybe. Well, let's see. You did 70 minus 18, which gave you 52 degrees. Yeah. And then what would you do with that 52 degrees? Well, I guess, I mean, I how, guess how that's... How would you use it to get the answer? Oh, wait, what am I, um... I'm, I'm saying that you, you would, you would probably, couldn't oh, you just that figure is the, out... that was the answer, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't think about that. All right, uh, let me, uh, that seems like a pretty big coincidence. Let's think about that for a second. So, um... When you, first of all, when you did that last problem, uh, I erased my work. Do you still have your work from that last problem? What did you yeah. plug in for the mass one? 26 grams. And what did you plug in for mass two? 49. Y you did plug in 49? Yeah. Okay. So um, I guess that was just a coincidence because um, the final temperature is going to depend on the two masses that we have. So um, there's no reason. So let's see. We have 70 plus 18 divided by 2 would be 44. So I think that was just a coincidence um, that these particular two masses happened, that happened to come out to be 52. How did you happen to notice that? <laughs> oh, I mean, I just, I, I was just looking over number 3, and, and I uh, saw 70 and 18. I, I quickly subtracted them, and then I looked uh, at the, I just realized that that was the same answer that I got. Not for number three. No, number three, not for, uh, number, for number two. Three. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. Well, that that's a good eye. That's that's good. You're thinking about that. But um, yeah, you can't. You obviously can't use that as as a rule because if we had had different masses, clearly we would have gotten a different answer. So um, it just so happens that with these particular masses, for some reason, uh, subtracting the two uh, temperatures happened to come out to give you the right answer. But the, I, I think that was just pure coincidence. Okay. If 84 grams of water at 22 degrees Celsius are mixed with 150 grams of ethanol at 88 degrees Celsius, find the final temperature. So they're looking for TF. And we can predict that the answer is going to be in between 22 degrees and 88 degrees Celsius. That's a good prediction. So now we would have to do uh, zero is equal to the summation of the Q's where 0 is equal to M1C1 delta T1 plus M2C2 delta T2 where 0 is equal to 84 times 4.184 times TF minus 22 plus 150 times 0 0.240 times TF Excuse me, what did you plug in for C2? 0 0.240 0 0.240 Two, four. Oh, um, I'm sorry, uh, not 0 0.240, 0, it would be, um, 2.460. 2.46, six. let's see. So I guess you got that from this table. Yeah, so it looks like you realized ethanol is the same as ethyl alcohol. So it's good that you realized we changed substances again here. 2.460. Okay, it looks like that was right. Good. 
All right, that was a good step. And then that's multiplied by What would go next? So now we would take our masses and, and multiply them to their respective... Good. What, what went uh, right here in your equation? A TF minus 88. TF minus 88. Okay, good. Now we take our um, respective our masses and multiply them by their respective... Mm -hmm. specific heat, so 84 grams times the specific heat of water, I get 351 times TF minus 22, and then 150 grams times 2.46 gives me 369 grams, or 369 uh, times TF minus 88, and you can distribute those, and then you get 0 is equal to 3. Seven seven three two point zero three two plus three six nine TF minus three two four seven two. I get zero is equal to seven twenty TF minus I get minus forty thousand two hundred and four and then add Forty thousand two hundred and four to both sides. And then divide that by 720, and I get approximately 57 degrees Celsius. 57? What was the calculation you just did? Uh, 40,204 divided by 720. Okay. 40,204. I get 56 when I did that. You must be used, rounding off different on your calculator. Those are pretty close. Okay. So does that match your prediction? Yes. Good. Uh, one thing that we should be a little more careful about is just to uh, put this in our heating chart, too. So what's the initial points on the heating chart? Uh, the initial points are 88 degrees and 22 degrees. So 22 degrees for which substance? Water. And what phase is that? In the liquid phase. So I would... Have here's an initial point, and then 88 degrees for what other substance? Um, that would be for the ethanol and the ethanol heating curve. So we need a whole other curve. Now the ethanol curve, I guess, would look like this. Or actually, I don't know. Maybe uh, I don't know what the, the freezing point and boiling points of ethanol are. So maybe a boiling point. Uh, but anyway, the portion of the curve that we care about. We'll just have to take it for granted that ethanol is not going to boil or uh, freeze at the temperatures that we're thinking about. So we'll just draw it like this. And it, the final point should be the same on both curves. So it's good. It's good to keep drawing these on the curve so that we can deal with harder and harder problems. Um, okay, and I think you ended up uh, with the right answer then. Try number five.
Actually, let me have a second here to clear off my palette. And 40 grams of water. Two hundred forty grams of water are mixed with the unknown mass of iron. Initially at 500 degrees Celsius, when thermal equilibrium is reached, the system has a temperature of 42 degrees Celsius. Find the mass of the iron. Well, we know that we have water initially at 240 degrees Celsius, and that's in the liquid phase. And we know say, say that, that again? we have 240 grams of water at 20 degrees Celsius initially, and that's in the liquid phase. That's right. Good. And then we have uh, the final temperature of the system is at 42 degrees Celsius. And then the... the uh, the iron is initially at 500 degrees Celsius. So that needs a whole other curve. And we know that since uh, the initials for both of the materials are 20 and 500, then 42 degrees Celsius is in between that. That makes sense. Good. So now we need to find the mass of the iron. Well, you can do... Um, We can do Q equals um, MC delta T, or we can do um, uh, what is it? Uh, zero is is equal to MC delta T uh, M M two C two delta T two, where zero is equal to M1, which is 240 times uh, 4.184 times, uh, let's see, it would be um, TF, which is 42 minus 20 plus M2 which we don't know and then C2 which for iron it is 0 0.444 uh, let's see iron Zero point four four four. Good. Now we can multiply the um, the masses by the respective specific heats. So zero is equal to two forty times four point one eight four. And I get a thousand and four. I'm sorry. Hold on. Um, 42 minus 20 is 22. So multiply 1004 by 22, the, the delta T. And we get 22,091. Say that again. 
22,091. Right. And then we have plus M2, and then 42 minus 500 is negative 458, times that by 0.444. And that's M2 times a negative 203.0. Yeah, just 203. So now we can um, we can factor out an M. No, we, we can't factor out an M. We can't factor out an M, but what we can do is we can subtract the negative 22,091 and then divide that by a negative 203. And I get approximately 108 grams. Let's see, I got 108.6. So what's the answer to the question? 107.3. Oh, you mean from the answer key. Yeah, what, what's the answer you got? I said 108. Okay. Um, I think uh, I wasn't really rounding off very much here, so maybe uh, our answer might be more accurate than the one that they got. Uh, but it looks like we uh, the difference is just rounding error. We did this correctly. All right, so um, now did you start by writing down a symbol for the question? What's a good symbol for this question? M. That's a good place to start, but then you, you got a more specific symbol as you went. What was really the symbol you used for what the question was asking? Oh, uh, the, the mass of the iron, so that would be like M sub Fe. Yeah, or it sounded like you were calling that M2 when you did the problem. Oh, yeah, M2. So the key is you want to use the same symbols that you're using in the rest of the problem. So uh, we want to see that's the mass because they, they have two different masses. So what's the first equation you wrote down? Zero equals the summation of the Qs. And in this case, there were two Qs, Q1 and Q2. We can build that into our picture here. Here's one phase step. What's the final temperature for the iron? Also 42. So this was step two. And then we did this. So is this a one sample or a two sample problem? Two sample. So you did it by saying that the sum of the heats adds up to zero because we're assuming this is insulated from the environment. So any heat that the iron is losing is being absorbed by the water. Well, that was good that you worked this out. This problem was a little bit um, different, a little bit harder than any of the ones we've done before. So it's good that you figured out how to do it. This is the first two sample problem we did that was asking for mass, but you, you adjusted to that. The key is we still start with the same general equation. We start with the same general equation. We're just solving for a different variable. And one thing that you're doing well here is you're being careful to always do T final minus T initial when you do the temperatures. By the way, um, based on common sense, should the water be having a positive or a negative Q? It should have a positive Q. Because we're moving to the right in this graph. And uh, did that match what you got in your math? <coughs> what was the Q um, for the water? The Q for the water was positive. Positive 22,000. So that came out right. And based on our common sense, should the iron have a positive or a negative Q? In this case, it should have a negative because it's giving, it's releasing heat. And you can see that came out right because this came out negative. And a negative times a positive is a negative. That's always a good thing to double check. 
The reason you got that right is because you did final minus initial here with this temperature. That's always a good thing to check. Um, okay, that's good. I think uh, I think we're done then with uh, this page. You're understanding how to do those problems. So let's move on. Let's see if there's any other harder problems here. Yeah, here's a good one. Oh, so first. Try number 10. Three gram sample of ice at negative 11 is placed in 214 grams of water. At 56 degrees Celsius, find the system's final temperature. <coughs> so we know that um, we have 38 grams of ice in the solid phase at negative 11 degrees Celsius. That's the initial temperature of the ice. And we have water, liquid water, in the liquid phase at 56 degrees Celsius. That's the initial temperature of the water. And we can... Oh, and they're asking for TF, the final temperature. And then we can predict that the final temperature of the system is going to be in between negative 11 and 56. So now we can do um, zero. We can use the equation zero equals the summation of the Q's, where zero is equal to M one C one delta T one. plus m2 c2 delta t2 that means 0 is equal to 38 times the specific heat of ice which is I think 2.01 yes and then tf minus a negative 11 so that's plus 11 then you have plus 214 times water, which is 4.184 times TF minus 56. So that means 0 is equal to 76. Let me give you a little help on this problem. So uh, let's see here. What what are you predicting about the final temperature? It's going to be in between negative 11 and 56 degrees. Right. What are you predicting as to the final phase? 
Oh, um. <clears throat> well, I'd uh, the final phase I'd say would be liquid. So, um, so then you would be predicting the temperature is between where and where? Fif uh, zero degrees Celsius and f fifty-six. So we could label this as our guess. So our, who are you guessing is going to change temperature more, the ice or the liquid water? The ice? Yeah. There's two reasons why that's a good guess. Um, first of all, what's the specific heat of liquid water? 4.184. And what's the specific heat of solid water? 2.01. So in general, is it easier to change the temperature of ice or of liquid water? Because it's uh, easier to change the temperature of ice. Because this number is smaller. It takes less energy to change the temperature of ice. That is one reason why you would expect the ice to change temperature more than the liquid water. So we're going to end up closer to the initial point for the liquid water than the ice. Also, which did we start with more of? Did we start with more liquid water or more ice? Uh, we started with more liquid water. Yeah, we have a lot of liquid water. Is that going to make it easier or hard to change the temperature of the liquid water? It's going to make it harder. Yeah, it's just like, um, you know, is it easy to boil um, a, a small pot of water on the stove or a great big kettle of water? It takes a lot longer to, to, bet, to boil a great big kettle, right? Because the greater the mass, the more heat it has to absorb. So for both those reasons, we would actually assume we're gonna, that we're gonna the liquid water is going to stay as liquid water. If you think about it, that's the same guess we've made on all the previous problems, right? All the previous problems, we've been guessing that the liquid water is going to stay in the liquid phase. Why, why have we been guessing the liquid water would stay in the liquid phase in all of these problems? Because liquid water has a higher specific heat than almost any other ordinary substance. And also, all of these problems have had way more of the liquid water than of everything else. So this seems like the best guess. Um, but then, how many steps is it going to take the solid water to reach here? Well, it's initially going to be one... What are the steps that the solid water will have to take to get to here? So the first step, it will have to be... Um, where it changes from negative 11 to 0 degrees, so that's Q equals MC delta T. Good. Where... Um, now what would be the second step? What's the second step that the initial ice has to go through? So then um, the second one would have to be where it changes um, from zero degrees to 50 degrees. I'm sorry, sorry. Um, what I meant to say was it's going to change from, uh, from, from ice to liquid, so it would be melting, so then we would have to use uh, Q equals ML. Okay, good. So for that step, the starting point is over here, ice at zero degrees, and the ending point is over here, water at zero degrees. So we could call that Q2. like so. And then um, are there any other steps that the that what started as the ice has to go through? Now it'll have to go from no uh, uh, actually no that would be it. So at the end of step two what does that, 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 that substance that was initially ice, what will be its phase and temperature at the end of step two? It'll be liquid water at 50 degrees Celsius. I'm not sure where you're getting that 50 degrees. I'm sorry, uh, what I meant to say, it's going to be uh, just liquid water at zero degrees Celsius. That's this point here. That's right. But is that the final temperature? No, we don't know that yet. We don't, but we were guessing the final temperature was up here, right? We were guessing the final temperature was here. It would be an amazing coincidence if the final temperature happened to be exactly zero degrees. Remember, we were guessing that the final temperature will be pretty close to 56. 
because it's pretty hard to change the temperature of liquid water and there's and there's a lot of liquid water. So the final temperature is probably going to be here. So I don't think that you finished with the stuff that started as ice because you only got this far and we need to get to here. The, the key thing I think that you're not doing is that I think you're not actually using the heating curve to solve the problem. The key to these problems is to always use the heating curve. I know some of these problems might have seemed so easy that maybe you didn't need the heating curve, but as the problems get harder, it's really important to actually use the heating curve to determine how to set things up. So in terms of the heating curve, step one got us to here. Step two got us to here. But we've, we're guessing that the final point is going to be somewhere like here. So that we could call step three. And that was the step that you were missing. So then I'd say step three is equal to uh, would be the um, uh, Q equals MC delta T of the uh, other mass of water. So I'll call that M3 C3 delta T3. Now, does Q3 refer, is this a one sample or a two sample problem? Two sample. Yeah, we have a sample that starts as ice and a sample that starts as water. Does Q1 refer to the sample that started as ice or the sample that started as water? Sample that started as ice. We should put in these little arrows here too. And does Q2 refer to the sample that started as ice or the sample that started as water? Sample that started as water. Oh, I don't think we're being consistent here. Um, so not the way I have it written anyway. Remember that step two here is this step on the graph? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it's going from, yeah, it'll be ice because it's going from ice to water. But anyway, this is the sample that originally started as ice, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, how about step three? Does step three refer to the sample that originally started as ice or the sample that originally started as water? The sample that originally started as water. Hmm. I, I guess we're not understanding that. Remember that we, so here's this, this, here's the sample that started as ice, right? Right. And it went through this step, then it went through this step, and now it's going through step three. This is still the same sample that originally started as ice. Maybe the thing that's confusing you is that at the start of step three, it's water. At the start of step three, it's water, water at zero degrees Celsius. That's why I use the word originally. This is the sample that was originally ice. Do you see why I'm saying that? Yeah because it started all the way down here. Remember, the ice is going to have to go like this, and then like this, and then like this, before it gets to the final temperature. Um, so sample three here, according to our graph, is, uh, is step three, does that refer to the sample that originally started as ice, or the sample that originally started as water? Uh, the sample that originally started as ice. That's right. It's not ice at the start of step three, but originally at the start of the problem, it was ice. All right. Now, we're, um, now the ice would be where we want it to be. It would be at the final point. We also need to think about the water. So how many steps uh, are, so now we're looking at the sample that started as water. How many steps is the sample that started as water going to have to go through to get to the final point? Just one. So let's call that step four. When you were first doing this problem on your own, you called that step two. But now that we're, we're, we kind of reconceptualized this, let's call that step four. Um, so that would be plus Q4. And what's the equation you're going to use to analyze step four? M4 C4 delta T4. Okay. One thing that I think might make this clearer to you is if you put in these arrows that show you which way the substances are moving. Notice that step one, step two, and step three are all arrows to the right, because that's the subsample that originally started as ice. Whereas sample four here um, is, start, uh, is moving to the left, because that's the sample that originally started as water. Okay, um, so the hard, uh, we had some trouble setting this problem up, but this would be the best way to set up this problem. So I definitely encourage you to start trying to always, always try to mark out all the steps on the heating curve before you start writing down the problem. Because when the problems get difficult, uh, it's hard to set things up correctly otherwise. All right, so now we can start plugging into this equation. So what are we going to plug in for M1? So C3 
zero is equal to thirty eight times two point zero one. Because in step one we have something that says ice. Times TF plus 11 plus 38 times 2.01. Well, unfortunately, again, at this point, the student and I both made a mistake. And again, we didn't catch it during the tutoring session. So I'm going to have to go back now and fix that for the YouTube video. Can you see what our mistake is? What's the mistake that we made here? If you haven't caught it already, you might want to pause the video to see if you can identify our mistake. Well, remember what we're trying to write down here is the heat transfer for step one. So um, here, delta T1 should be T final one minus T initial one. What's the initial temperature in step one? Negative 11. We got that right. But what is the final temperature at the end of step one? Actually, the final temperature at the end of step one is just zero, right? Final temperature at the end of step one should be zero, uh, not T final, which is the symbol we were using for this temperature. So that was our mistake. This should be a zero. All right, so I guess I can see how we got confused. Here, we're supposed to be doing a final minus initial, but the final temperature at the end of step one is not the same as the final temperature at the end of the entire process. The final temperature at the end of step one is not the same thing as the final temperature at the end of the entire process. It should have been obvious to us from the heating curve that the final temperature at the end of step one is zero degrees Celsius because that's when the ice stops heating up. The ice stops heating up at zero, so we should have put in a zero there. All right, and then uh, I guess now I have to finish the problem. M2, this is still the sample that started as ice, so that's still 38. And then we need to look up the heat of fusion for ice. So from the tables that we were using before, we saw that the heat of fusion was positive 334. Be sure to put in that positive sign because we're moving to the right, so we're gaining heat. Now for step three, the key thing to keep in mind is that the sample in step three is the sample that originally started as ice, so its mass is still 38 for step three. In step three, we're dealing with the sample that originally started as ice, so its mass is still the same, 38. But now in step three, that sample isn't ice anymore. In step three, that sample is now liquid water. So now its specific heat, C3, is 4.184. And now the final temperature is really the unknown temperature, Tf. And what's the initial temperature? Well, the initial temperature obviously isn't negative 11. The initial temperature at the beginning of step three is zero. Now we're doing step four, which is the sample that starts as water. So its mass is 214. And it's in the liquid phase, so its specific heat is 4.184. It ends up at the unknown final temperature and started at 56. Now we have some arithmetic and algebra to do. 38 times By the way, I should say here, so be careful to always do, when you're doing delta T, it's always final minus initial. Each of these has to be final minus initial, but remember, the final temperature for one particular step might not be the same as the final temperature for the entire series of steps. Forgetting that was the mistake that we made in the original tutoring session. 
So here we have 38 times 2.01 times positive 11. 840.18 plus 38 times 334. 12692 plus 38 times 4.184 158.992 TF. The zero term drops out. 214 times 4.184 TF is 895.376 TF. And 214 times 4.184 times negative 56 is negative 50141.056. Now we collect terms. 840 plus uh, 0.18 plus 12.692 minus 50,141.056 is negative 36,608.876 158.992TF plus 895.376 TF 1054.368 TF. Add this term to both sides, so we get 36608.876. Now we want to isolate the TF, so we divide both sides by this term. to the division and I got 34.7 degrees. That's the answer and that matched our original guess. We were guessing that the final temperature would end up in the liquid water phase and that guess turned out to be correct. <coughs> Remember that we were only guessing that the final temperature would be in this region. Um, it's possible that um, the final point might have been in this region or this region. How could we test whether our guess was correct? Well, if the guess had been wrong, then the final temperature would have come out to be zero or less than zero or less than zero. What would happen if um, the temperature had come out to be zero or less than zero? Well, because that didn't match our original guess, we would actually then have to do the whole problem all over again with a different guess. Then we would have to try solving the problem supposing that the final point was in this region or in this region. Um, th those, would, those are actually, uh, I think I mentioned this in the previous video, those are actually problems that we, we never actually covered in this video series. I think, I think most chemistry courses are not going to ask you a question that hard on an exam, as I might have talked about in uh, the previous uh, video. Um, you might see questions that hard uh, in the homework, but I, I think it would be a little unusual to see a question that hard on the test. So in any case, in this case, we were fortunate that our original guess turned out to be correct. As I explained in the tutoring session, Usually the best guess is that you're going to stay in the liquid water phase because liquid water is harder to change the temperature of than most other substances. And that was certainly a good guess here because we had way more liquid water than ice, which again makes the liquid water less likely to change temperature. So to wrap this up, what's the big lesson to take from this? One thing um, that maybe I should have emphasized more in the tutoring session is 
set up the heating curve before you start writing down any equations. So before we wrote any of this, before we wrote any of this, we should have written the heating curve and identified the four steps. Steps one, two, three, and four. Only then should we write zero equals Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3 plus Q4 and start going through the steps. Don't go to the math too fast. Lay out the steps in the heating curve uh, ahead of time. That's a good way to uh, avoid mistakes. And then the other lesson here was um, you should try to avoid the mistake um, that we made in our session. Um, delta T is always final minus initial, but remember that the final temperature for a particular step is not necessarily the final temperature for the whole process. The mistake we made when we did this problem together is that I wrote T final here. And you can see why, because I did want a final temperature, but I didn't want the final temperature for the whole process. I wanted to put the final temperature for step one, which should have been zero. And one more thing I wanted to emphasize is the importance of getting this sign right. Remember that in this problem, we were going through melting or fusion. So we took the heat of fusion from the table, which is positive 334. But suppose we had been going in this direction. Suppose that we'd been freezing the water. Well, then we wouldn't use the exact number from the table because the table gives us the heat of fusion. If we'd actually been freezing, then we would have to put in negative 334. That's one of the most common sources of mistakes. So the safest thing is to always put a sign on these latent heats. Again, we did it right on our problem. In our problem, we were moving to the right, so this was a heat of fusion and it should be positive. But you really need to watch out for what happens when you're moving to the left. The tables don't directly tell you the heat of freezing. Instead, you have to say, well, if the heat of fusion is positive 334, then the heat of freezing would be negative 334. So pay careful attention to the sign for your latent heat. Again, for this problem, we really were moving to the right, so we really did do it correctly by just taking the positive value from the table. All right, so now let's try number 11. 25 grams of uh, 116 degree steam are bubbled into 0.2384 kilograms of water at 8 degrees Celsius. Find the temperature, find the final temperature of the system. So they're looking for TF. And since the initial point of the steam is 116 degrees Celsius, and we also have 0.2384 kilograms, which will have to convert to grams. That's 238. Uh, grams of water at 8 degrees Celsius and that's in the liquid phase we can predict that our that our um, final temperature will be in between those two temperatures and the final phase will be water So now we can say zero is equal to the summation of the Q's. So now in the first step, we have steam at negative, um, or sorry, at 116 degrees C. And then that's going to reach 100 degrees Celsius. So that would be Q is equal to MC delta T, M1C1 delta T1, where the steam goes from 116 degrees Celsius to 100. And then the second part of the equation would be the steam 
going to water, so Q is equal to ML. at 100 degrees Celsius. The third one is, um, the third step is the um, water at 100, well, we going to the final temperature, that's Q is equal to M to C to delta T to where the liquid water goes to or goes from um, 100 degrees Celsius to the final temperature TF and then the the fourth step would be um, Q equals MC Delta T M M3 C3 Delta T3 um, and that would be for the other mass of the water. So that means zero would equal twenty five grams times uh, two point zero one times TF minus eight degrees Celsius. I'm sorry, not uh not TF, it would be 116 minus 100. Sorry, sorry, no. It would be 100 minus 116 temperature final minus temperature initial. That would be plus M, which is 25, times the heat of vaporization, which is 2260. And then Q would, and then now uh, for the third part, it would be 25 grams times. Now we have liquid water, which is 4.184. And then we would uh, multiply that by TF minus 100. And then the fourth part of the equation would be um, uh, 238 grams times 4.184 times TF minus eight. So twenty five times two point zero one times a negative sixteen is equal to negative 804 plus 25 times 2260 plus 56500 plus 25 times 4.184 that's equal to 104.6 times TF minus 100. And then 238.4 times 4.184. That is equal to 997 times TF minus 8. So now we can distribute it.
And then we still get negative 804 plus 56500 plus 104TF. And then that's minus uh, 10,460 plus 997.4656 TF minus... Negative seven nine seven nine and now combine like terms uh. Seven nine seven nine. Now we would get um negative thirty seven thousand two five six. So now we get 1,102 TF minus 37,256. Hmm. So sorry, sorry, let me interrupt you. All right, that looks like there was looked like there was a, a problem with that calculation, but, but let's back up here. Um, so going back to this problem here, so did you did you draw a heating curve? Yeah. And did you write down these steps? Uh huh. And did you put arrows in each step to show what direction it's moving? Yeah. So what's the arrow for step four? Step four would be it's going up. And to the right. And step three? Is going down and to the left. And step two? Two and one are down and to the left. To the left. Okay. I guess we're not using this curve. Um, so it sounded like you were being careful about setting up those steps. Um, remember, finish the heating curve before you start writing any equations. Because it sounded to me when, when you were talking that you were, sometimes you were mi mixing up the steps. Sometimes you, you, were, you, were, you were referring to, say, step three when I think you meant step two or referring to step four when I thought you meant step three. That sounded like, excuse me, sounded like there might have been some confusion there. So anyway, finish labeling the heating curve before you start doing any of the algebra. Once you have the heating curve, then you can start the math. Now, um, should step one be a positive or a negative heat exchange based on common sense? Negative. Why? Because it's... <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, step one because it's losing heat. Good. Now, what did you get as Q1? Did it come out negative? Q1 came out as negative 804. Good. So is that right? Does that... Does right. That, yeah. Now, how about step two? Do we predict that to be a positive or a negative Q? Step two is negative, or it should be negative. Yeah, how do you know it should be negative? Because we're losing heat. Because, yeah, we're moving to the left here. Oh, I, for I forgot to uh, 
put in the negative heat of vaporization. Yeah, because actually we don't want the heat of vaporization because it's not vaporizing. What's it actually doing? It's um, condensing. So we need to go back to that table. Which table is that? Whoops. Not this one. This one. Now, I think we talked about this a little bit last time. This table doesn't tell you the heat of condensation, but you can figure out the heat of condensation from here. What is the heat of condensation? The heat of condensation is just the negative 2260. That's right. I, I might have confused you a little because I kind of tried to teach you. I, d I taught you a different approach in our first session than in our second session. But once we get the hang of it, I think that this new approach is the best one. So anyway, um, this doesn't tell you the heat of condensation, but you can figure out that the heat of condensation is negative 2260. But that means we made a mistake here. We shouldn't have plugged in positive 2260. We should have plugged in negative. Um, I waited a while before I pointed that out because I wanted to give you a chance to catch that mistake on your own. How could you have caught that mistake? Well, remember, you should always ask whether your numbers are coming out with reasonable signs. You should have said to yourself, gee, this represents heat too, and I know from my graph that's supposed to be negative. That's the way you could have caught your mistake, because it is very common for people to make sign mistakes here. It's important to be able to catch those mistakes by asking whether the numbers make sense. Okay, uh, but the best thing, obviously, would be to get it right from the start. So remember that when you look at the table, they're going to give you the heat of fusion and the heat of vaporization. If you need the heat of freezing or the heat of condensing, you need to figure that out for yourself and remember that it's the negative of the other two heats. That, that's one of the most common mistakes, so it's important to highlight that. Um, getting the right sign might not be too exciting, but that, that's the key to getting the whole problem right. So we don't need to change very much here. We just have to change this from a positive to a negative and this from a positive to a negative. Um, and then um, the other two ones you can't check as carefully. Since they have variables, you can't tell whether they're coming out positive or negative. So you just have to be careful to set them up right. But I think you did that correctly, T final minus initial here and T final minus initial. So you did a good job when you were doing the, the change in temperature. This is the correct temperature for step one. This is the correct temperature change for step three and four. Uh, it was just this negative sign, but that, that, that can make a big difference right then. Okay, so we'll get, you're going to have to do one of those calculations over again then here. Oh, well, then it's just um, uh, step two where it's just mass times the negative 2260, so you get negative 56500. Zero, zero. That's right. Yeah, so all you have to do is change that to a negative. But now you have to do another, now, now at this point you are starting to collect terms. So you're going to have to do that collecting terms calculation again. Well, um, first one is negative because we're losing heat. Second is negative because we're losing heat. Third step should be negative because we're losing heat where we get a positive 104. Now this step you can't really check because this step has has a variable has two terms so you can't really check whether it comes out positive or negative uh, as long as you did the temperatures correctly it should come out correctly right you, you did t final minus t initial so that one should come out correctly maybe I'm confusing you by telling you that you should check each of the steps you should check the steps where it's possible to check them this one can't be checked because it has a variable in it and step four can't be checked because it has a variable so you just have to make sure you set it up correctly uh, all I'm saying is now is time to use your calculator to, um, to, to collect terms again. When you used your calculator before here, it, it came out wrong because you were putting in a positive number. So now we have to do that step on the calculator over again. Oh, oh um, okay. So negative 804 plus 10,460, negative 10,460 plus a negative 56500 plus a negative 7979. And I get, and then uh, 104 TF plus 997 TF gets me uh, 1,102 TF minus a 75,743. And then you can just add 75,743 to both sides.
divided by 1,102. And TF is equal to Sixty-eight point seven degrees Celsius. Okay. Um, so, and did that match our guess? Remember that we were guessing that the temperature would end up in this region, and that guess turned out to be correct. Um, okay. So, um, once again, when you have two substances, liquid water and something else, whose temperature will probably change less? The uh, other, or the liquid water. Yeah, so that, that's, I think that's how it's going to turn out in all the problems in your course. So that's why we assumed the final temperature was here and not here or here, because it's harder to change the temperature of the liquid water than of other things. Um, all right, so again, my advice is set up the whole heating curve with all the steps, just like I've been writing it down, before you start writing down any math. Um, be careful to be consistent about the numbers you assign to the steps. Um, one thing that you did that was good here is you noticed the units. We haven't talked about this much, but you have to be very careful with units on these problems. So it's good that you converted the kilograms into 238 uh, grams. How did you know that you needed grams and not kilograms for this problem? Um, How did you know we needed grams and not kilograms for the steam? Because um, the uh, specific heat... And, and uh, heat of fusion and vaporization, they're all uh, joules per gram. So the units needed to cancel out. That's right. So the tables that we've been using are in grams. That's why you had to change it into grams to be consistent with our specific heat and our heat of condensation. But uh, again, let me warn you, I'm not sure you're going to use these exact constants when you take your real test. When you take your test, the constants might be in terms of kilograms. So then you'll have to use kilograms. So you have to be very awake to the exact units in the constants that you're given. Also remember, the constants you're given might be in kilojoules. So then you'd have to adjust and use kilojoules. So you have to pay close attention to the constants that your instructor gives you for the test. They might not look exactly like this table, uh, but you need to make sure that the numbers that you're using are all consistent. So let me ask you a question. What is the heat of freezing of silver? What is the heat of freezing of silver? Negative 101 joules. Say that one more time. Negative 101 joules. I think, I think you're just mispronouncing it. It's negative 111, right? I'm sorry, 111, yeah. 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 All right, now the key thing is that was a trap. The important thing is that you said negative. Um, because the table gives us the heat of fusion, the heat of freezing is the negative of that. Good. Um, what is the heat of condensation for gold? What's the heat of condensation for gold? Negative 1,578 joules per gram. Yeah, so if you were condensing gold, you'd have to use negative 1,000, negative, negative 1,578. You saw in this problem how that's really hard to remember, right? Um, it's very easy just to go to the table and pick out the positive number. So you need to remember that you might need to put a negative sign in front of these. That's, that's a really important thing to highlight from our tutoring session today. That's a, a very common trap on tests. Of course, in real life, you probably wouldn't be condensing gold because gold isn't usually in a vapor. But anyway, that, that's good practice. Um, what would be the heat of fusion of butane? What's the heat of fusion of butane? Heat of fusion of butane would be 80.1 joules per gram. Positive or negative? Positive. Yeah. So in that case, you'd use the positive number. So you just have to be very careful. Um, these only give fusion and vaporization. Condensation and freezing are the negatives of those. That's really important to highlight and not forget when the test comes around. That's a real common trap that people tend to lose points on. All right, let's try number 12. Oh, no. I keep forgetting. i got to clear my page here.
oh, I wanted to do one other exercise with you. Um, on that last problem that we were just doing, gee, I lost the steps, but I think these were the steps. One, two, three, four. So what did we start with in step one? From that last problem, what did we start with in step one? Um, we started with steam. At what temperature? At 116 degrees Celsius. Yeah. So the, the thing I want you to learn to do is it's always important to specify to yourself both a phase and a temperature. So that was steam at 116. What did we end with at the end of step one? What did we have at the end of step one? We ended with um, water. Sorry, no, we, we still had steam, but it was at a different temperature. What temperature was it at? Uh, 100 degrees Celsius. Yeah, so we ended at this point, this is still steam, steam at 100. We ended with steam at 100. Um, now, what did we start with at the start of step two? Uh, the start of step two, we started now with uh, steam going to water. So what did we start with at the start of step two? Steam. And remember, we need to mention the temperature as well. At 100 degrees Celsius. We started again here with steam at 100 degrees Celsius. And what did we end with at the end of step two? Uh, we ended with liquid water at 100 degrees Celsius. Liquid water at the same temperature, 100 degrees Celsius. Good. What did we start with at the beginning of step three? At the beginning of step three, we started with water at 100 degrees Celsius. Good. And what did we end with at the end of step three? Water uh, at some unknown final temperature. Well put. Well put. At the end of step three, we had water at some unknown final temperature. Eventually, we figured out that that temperature was uh, 68.7. Is that right? But we didn't know that from the start. Now, what did we start with at the beginning of step four? We started with a different sample of water at, I believe, 8 degrees Celsius. And we ended with water at uh, some unknown final temperature. That's well put, again. Okay, so that's important to get in the habit of doing that. You have to be very clear about what's happening in each step or we're going to get the math wrong. So remember that you need to specify the phase and temperature at the beginning of the step and the phase and temperature at the end of the step. At least in your mind, you need to, to specify those. Those should be clear from the graph, but sometimes people have trouble with that. Okay. For example, if you had specified to yourself that in step two, we were going from steam at 100 degrees Celsius to liquid at 100 degrees Celsius, that might have reminded you that that, that should be a negative heat exchange, which was the main problem we had in the last problem. All right, so now let's try number 12. A 332 sample of lead specific heat 0 0.138 is placed in 264 grams of water at 25 degrees Celsius. If the system's final temperature is 46 degrees Celsius, what was the initial temperature of the lead? So they are looking for Ti, and since we know that the lead is, um, hmm. I'm sorry, the water is initially in the water phase at 25 degrees Celsius, and the final temperature of the system is at 46, that means that we can, uh, we can assume that the final temperature of the lead is in between 25 and 46 degrees Celsius. So in the first step,
in the first step we'll have q equals m1 c1 delta t1 where the um, where the sample of water goes from 25 degrees Celsius to 46 degrees Celsius And then we can, in the second equation, we can also use Q equals M2C2 delta T2, where um, it's, yeah. So then we can say 0 is equal to the summation of the Qs, where 0 is equal to M1C1 delta T1, where M is 264 times 4.184 times TF46 minus TI25 plus M2C2 delta T2 where M is 322 times uh, 0 0.138 times delta T2 which is equal to um, 46 minus ti. So now we can uh, multiply. Uh, where did my calculator go? Oh, there it is. Two sixty four times four point one eight four times twenty one. So zero now is equal to twenty three one nine six point yeah one nine six plus three twenty two times point one three eight. That's equal to 44 times 46 minus ti. And then we can distribute that. So that's 0 is equal to 23,196 plus 2,044 minus 44 ti. Twenty-two thousand one hundred ninety-six, two thousand forty-four, and that is equal to, or minus forty-four uh, ti, and then twenty-three thousand one hundred ninety-six plus two thousand forty-four is equal to twenty-five thousand two hundred forty minus forty-four point four three six ti. And then you can add 44.436 TI to both sides. And then that's 25,240 divided by 44.436 TI is equal to 568 uh, degrees Celsius, which is the initial uh, which is the initial temperature of the lead. Does that match your prediction? 
No, it doesn't. What was your prediction? Or no, sorry. Uh, yeah. Wait, what? It just. I don't think I even made a prediction for this one. Uh, you, you did make a prediction. You might have forgotten it. Well, so so going back on this problem, it seemed to me, um, the, the one difficulty of this problem, it seemed to me like maybe you were going to the math again a little too fast before you had really clarified your heating curves. So let's go back and clarify the heating curves. Um, so how many steps do you need to show on your heating curves for this problem? Three. Three steps? Okay. Well, what did you start with at the beginning of step one? I'm sorry, um, not three, but two. Okay. Well, what did you start with at the beginning of step one? Um, step one, I started with water from uh, liquid water, and uh, that was initially at 25 degrees Celsius. So and you started with liquid water at 25 degrees Celsius, and what did you end step one with? We, uh, I ended with liquid water at 46 degrees Celsius. Good, and so it should look like this. And did you remember to put in an arrow? What direction is the arrow pointing? Up and to the right. Good. Now how about step two? What did you start with at the beginning of step two? We have um, a known mass of lead at some unknown temperature, and we ended with um, lead at 46 degrees Celsius. So you put that on this graph, right? Yeah, on uh, number two, uh, above the 46 degrees, uh, going down. So here's the unknown initial temperature. And that's step two. All right, now that's correct. That's not what you said when you were first doing it. When, what you said was that you predicted that the initial temperature... So what do we predict about the initial temperature of the lead? It would, I guess we could predict that it would, it would either be, um, well, yeah, I, mean, I guess it would have to be above 46 because then how, how else would you in increase the final temperature of the water? Okay, that's right. That, that, that's well put. That's good. That's a good insight. I think that when you first did the problem, you might not, not have had that insight. So that's right. Um, when you first did this problem, you were actually predicting what you said was that the initial temperature should be between 25 and 46. You were predicting, I think what happened was that you were kind of a little bit influenced by the patterns from the previous problems. In the previous problems, the final temperature ended up between the two initial temperatures. But that doesn't apply here because we're not trying to find the final temperature, we're trying to find the initial. So I think you didn't quite break out of that pattern. It might have helped here to make a little bit of a picture we have one substance, which is water, and that's being put in contact with another substance, which is lead. Um, and we know which way is the heat flowing. Is the heat flowing into the water or out of the water? It's flowing into the water. What was the clue in the problem? They didn't tell you that explicitly. What's the clue in the problem that tells you that heat is flowing into the water? The, the final temperature? Which is above 25. Yeah. So the clue, and this is what you mentioned a moment ago, the clue is that the temperature of the water is increasing. So it must be the one that's absorbing heat. So we're moving to the right. You can see that even from this graph. Therefore, what's, what's the lead doing? Absorbing or releasing heat? It's releasing heat. It must be because the water is absorbing heat. Remember we assume that these problems are insulated from the environment. So if one substance gains heat, it must come from the other substance. So by we know that the lead must be releasing heat. So what would we predict is happening to the lead's temperature? It's decreasing. Which means that we predict that it started above 46. So I think those were ideas that weren't really quite clear to you when you were first doing the problem. You were predicting the initial temperature was between these two temperatures because you were influenced by the patterns from the previous problems. Now, so did, did the answer that we get match our new prediction? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it makes sense here. The lead actually started out really hot. What happened here is we took some really smoking hot lead and we dumped it in the water and the water cooled off the lead and the lead also heated up the water. 
but we know the water's temperature didn't change nearly as much as the lead's. So that's usually the pattern in all of these problems um, that we've been doing. All right, now in this case, getting the wrong prediction and conceptualizing the problem incorrectly a little didn't lead you to the wrong answer. You were still able to get the answer correctly here. But in other problems, that could really mess you up. So again, it's important before you start um, doing any math, before you even write Q1 plus Q2, write down all the steps in your, in your graphs. Try to conceptualize all the steps in your graphs before you even say zero equals Q1 plus Q2, because you don't even know how many steps there are until you've finished the heating curves. Okay, but anyway, we ended up getting uh, the correct answer here, 568. So you can see there's lots of variations on the problems they can give you here. We've done a lot of problems where they're asking for the final temperature. We did one or two problems where they were asking for the mass, and here we did a problem where they were asking for the initial temperature. So um, that one uh, we got right. So let's see here. 12 is the initial temperature. Okay, good. Next. Let's do number eight here. Uh, so the instructions are here to find the energy change for the system. Uh, I forgot to erase. So yeah, your instructions are find the energy change for the system for number eight. To 100 grams of steam at 118 degrees C to water at 100 degrees Celsius. So they're looking for a Q. Because the problem is find the energy change for the system. That was uh, written up here. All right, good. And now we know that. And now we know that we have a uh, steam initially at 118 degrees C. And then that goes to a final temperature of 100 degrees C. And it's still steam. And then we have a phase change where steam goes to liquid at 100 degrees C. So our first equation will be Q equals MC delta T. And then our second equation will be Q equals ML. So Q total is equal to MC delta T plus ML, where Q total is equal to 12,000 grams times 2.01 times 100 minus 118, which is negative 18, plus 1,200 times 2,260. And we can make a prediction that the, the change will be um, negative because it's going from steam to water, so it's losing heat.
So Q total is equal to negative 43,416 plus a negative 271,000. No, two million seven hundred twelve thousand actually twelve hundred times two two six zero. Yeah, negative two million seven hundred twelve thousand. And we add those up forty three thousand four hundred sixteen. So the change in Q is equal to negative two million seven hundred and fifty five thousand four hundred sixteen joules and if you divide that by a thousand that's equal to two thousand seven hundred fifty five kilojoules Are these the intermediate numbers you got? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so let's see here. Um, one thing I didn't hear you saying specifically, you're using the heating curve, so that's good. Let's, we should be a little more specific about labeling the steps. This is step one, and this is step two. So then our first equation would be Q total equals Q1 plus Q2. I didn't remember hearing you say that anyway. All right, so that would be a good place to start and to put in our arrows here, like so. Is this a one sample or a two sample problem? One sample? Yeah, so I, as uh, basically I just wanted to go back and do one brief one sample problem because I wanted to make sure you hadn't forgotten how to do those. So notice, would this be a good equation to use on this problem? Can we use this equation? No. No, because this is only for two sample problems. Here, we can't assume that the heat exchanges add up to zero because we only have one sample. It's releasing heat, but we don't know who's absorbing the heat. So it's good that you didn't try to use the two sample approach. Um, and it's good that you predicted that this would be negative. What, what was the symbol that you would use for what they're asking us? Q. Good, except remember you want to make that match your work. So it would be better now to call this Q total. They're not asking for Q1 or Q2 plus Q total. You predicted that both energy changes should be negative and they came out that way. When did we lose more heat? When the temperature was falling or when we were condensing? When we were condensing. That's right. Um, we lost a lot of heat here when, uh, when this was condensing. We talked about this last time. The heat of vaporization and heat of condensation for water is a very big number. Remember, that's one reason why evaporation is such a good way to cool you, because when the water evaporates, it absorbs a lot of heat. Well, the reverse of that is when water condenses, it deposits a lot of heat. That's why uh, steam can be very dangerous, or one reason why steam can be dangerous. When the steam, uh, when the steam condenses, it's releasing a lot of heat. Okay, so uh, I think that came out right, and I think you got the right units for this. Does this match what they got here? Hmm. One, two, three. Yeah, so that looks like that matches theirs. Good. Now, We've been given that the heat of vaporization is 2.26 kilojoules per gram. Suppose, remember, uh, we don't know exactly how you're going to be given the constants on the test. You might not be given these exact tables. 
if you were given this for this same problem that we were just working on, how would you adapt that in order to be able to use it? You just multiply it by a thousand to get joules. Why do you have to change this into joules? You, well, I guess you, you wouldn't necessarily, well, I know that when you use a C and, and a L, mm -hmm. those are in, in grams per, or joules per gram, but I well, don't see is, why mm -hmm. you, you couldn't just convert, you know, all of the, the grams to kilograms and, and also just use that. You probably could get the same answer. Okay, so let's say you were given these two constants. Now, you just mentioned kilograms, but that's not really relevant to this problem because all, everything here is in grams. The issue is joules versus kilojoules. Uh, now, well, here's the problem. We'd have to use joules because the, the specific heat and the latent heat are, are given in joules. Well, remember I was just saying, suppose the latent heat was actually given in kilojoules per gram. Suppose well, that this, but so would, here's, yeah, here's the issue. The point I'm making is it's actually pretty common for tables to give the specific heat in joules and the heat of vaporization in kilojoules. And when that happens, you need to change one of these so they're consistent with each other. It's probably easiest to put everything into joules. So how would you put this into joules? You multiply it by a thousand. Yeah, formally, what's the unit conversion you're doing? What conversion ratio are you using? You're using a thousand joules per one kilojoule. One thousand joules per one kilojoule. And then when you did that, you would get two, two, six, zero kilojoules. Nope, joules per gram, which is the number that we were given here anyway. And then everything would come out in joules, which matches the specific heat. So the thing that I'm warning you about is that the table your instructor gave you on this, uh, in this packet is a little bit unusual. Um, this is a very nice table because everything is in joules, in joules. But it's actually pretty common for the specific heats to be in joules and the heats of fusion and vaporization to be in kilojoules per gram. And if that happens, maybe the simplest thing that you can do to deal with that is do a conversion like this and change the heat of vaporization into uh, regular joules. So that basically what I'm just telling you is pay close attention to the units uh, when you're taking the exam uh, because they can mess you up. Um, how about this other table that your instructor gave you? So here's another table that your instructor uh, gave you. Uh, hopefully they're not going to give you this. All right, these specific heats uh, are still in joules. Hopefully they're not. Sometimes that the heats of fusion and vaporization can be in moles, but I don't think they would give you that on this type of problem. But that, that's something to watch out for. Make sure that you're using joules, I mean grams and not moles. Uh, hopefully that's not going to uh, come up. We got this. Ah, yeah. So take a look at these specific heats. What are the units for the specific heats in these tables? Whoops, I lost it. What are the units for the specific heats in these tables? Um, they're in kilojoules per kilogram degrees Kelvin. This is another table that your instructor gave you. Now, they also have these other units here, too, um, which hopefully you're not going to be tested on. But if the problem is about calories or kilocalories, you might want to use this column. Um, I don't think they're going to use this column here. Um, so uh, let's see. How would we change this? Now, the pro how would we change this, say, to joules per gram um, per degree Celsius? How would you change this to joules per gram, per degree Celsius, if you had to do that, how would you go from here to here? Well, I'd first multiply um, by a thousand kilojoules. A uh, thousand joules per one kilojoule. So the kilojoules will cancel out. That'll give you a thousand joules per kilogram degrees Kelvin. Then you can 
divide by one a thousand grams per one kilogram so one kilogram per a thousand grams so the kilograms will cancel out you'll get uh, joules per one joule per one gram degree Kelvin uh, I guess you could I don't know um, multi oh, um, multiply one Kelvin per one degree Celsius and the Kelvin will ca cancel out and you'll get one joule per one gram per degree ke uh, Celsius. So here's a, a specific heat that's 0 0.13, 0 0.13 kilojoules per kilogram per degree Kelvin. What would that be? Oh, point, sorry. Uh, point 0.13 point kilojoules thir per kilogram per degree Kelvin. What would that be in joules per gram per degree Celsius? So then... It'd be 0 0.13 uh, joules per gram degree Celsius. So I think what you figured out is that numerically it wouldn't change? Yeah. Okay. So here's what to do if you see this table. Um, I think unit conversions, it's best to do in one fell swoop. So you see how I've written this. You can do this all in one swoop. You can get rid of the kilojoules with this conversion ratio. Then you can get rid of the kilograms with this conversion ratio. But notice that now you have a thousand on the top and a thousand on the bottom and the thousands are going to cancel. So those two things cancel out. And I think you realized that one, a change of one degree Kelvin is the same as a change of one degree Celsius. I think we talked about that last time. We talked about how when you're focusing on the change in temperature, one degree Kelvin is the same change as one degree Celsius. So it's easy to go from Kelvin to Celsius. So the point is, if you were given these specific heats, you really already know joules per gram per degree Celsius as well, because they wouldn't change. Um, all right, so uh, I can't predict exactly what types of specific heats um, you're going to see and, and vapor, what types of units you're going to see on the test. So all I can say is pay close attention to the units on every problem and try to do careful unit conversions if you have to. Don't do the unit conversions in your head. Uh, try to do each of those uh, carefully on paper to make sure that you're getting those right. These videos are offered on a pay-what-you-like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos at my website. There's a link to my website in the info box. The address is www.freelance-teacher.com slash videos.htm Or you can just use the link in the info box. Thank you.